In my early teenage years, I had a very short career as a BMX bike racer. And I mean very short because I was terrible at this. Let me paint a picture for you. There was a dirt track at the Douglas County Fairgrounds that had uh, big twists and turns, had triple jumps, double jumps, these big hills to climb up. And you are at the top of a hill waiting for the gate to drop with up to 10 other people, uh, 10 other teenage boys who are all driven by testosterone and told by their fathers, you be the first one to cross that finish line. You better believe carnage ensued. Wrecks and broken bones and blood. And on either side of the track, there were two ditches. At one point on a corner, the ditch turned into this nasty, murky, green water. And we had shoes that kind of locked into the pedal so your foot didn't slip off. So like if I go into this water in my young teenage mind, I was a bit dramatic. I thought I'm going to die. <laughs> I'll drown because I'm strapped into this metal contraption and this is deep water. And on the other side, there was a ditch of just some yucky mud, sticky. And, and so my goal was never to win, right? Like I saw the carnage. I saw the impact and the broken bones and the blood. I just wanted to survive to the end of the day. Like I wanted to see tomorrow. And so... I would navigate the track. And when I went over the jumps, it's like I was slowly going over speed bumps. I never won a trophy. I just wanted to make it through to the other side, avoiding the ditches so that I didn't get hurt. Today's conversation is going to be a little bit like that first race. Our subject is holiness. And just like that race, I wanted to avoid the ditches on either side of the track. I wanted to walk the middle of the road. There are ditches on either side of the call to holiness. And here's what they look like. The first one I call legalism. When you hear the call to obey and the call to holiness, you can take that and twist it into a false gospel called legalism, where instead of recognizing God views me as holy and now I can live accordingly, trying to earn holiness. Really, legalism is marked by the, the desire to earn God's grace or to earn love or to earn acceptance by practically trying to be holy apart from God. That's legalism. It's earning God's grace. The other ditch, though, is just as dangerous. It says it's called license. And license, in contrast to earning grace, it actually abuses grace. And it says, uh, it doesn't matter how I live before God. He's my father. He's got lavish grace. So I can do whatever I want. Both of these ditches are false gospels. And so today, what we're doing is we're, we're going to try, I'm going to try the best I can as a fallible man to navigate the middle of the road as we look at Peter's high calling to believers. And here's what I'm asking of you. When we leave here today, as we've talked about holiness, uh, my challenge to you is to go home and search these things out for yourself. Do not just take my word for it. Go home, read the passage again, listen to the spirit. What is he calling you to? Because I'm gonna do the best I can with the preparation I've done, but I'm not God. And God's word is living and active. And there's depths in this passage that we don't have time to reach today. And so I challenge you, don't let the end of the service today be the end of you being challenged by God's word on what it means to live holy. Go home and search these things out. Talk about them as a family, all right? So today we're, we're looking at the call to holiness. We're gonna be in 1 Peter 1, verses 13 to 21. And before we get in there, we need to have an understanding of what, what is holiness? Like, there, there's lots of ideas about holiness, right? A, a guy with a long beard sitting up on a hill going, "Om." or maybe you think of the phrase like holy guacamole, right? What does holiness actually mean? When we talk about the holiness of a believer, there's really two ways we talk about it. Firstly, it's positional holiness. That before God, you and I in Christ are viewed holy, not because of anything we do, but because of what Christ already did. That he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians. And so that's the great exchange. Jesus takes my sin and I get his righteousness credited to my account. The perfect life that he lived is now credited to me. That's positional holiness that never changes for a believer based on your performance. God looks at you and he sees you as a holy being. 
But that's not the holiness that's in view in Peter's passage today. The holiness that Peter's gonna challenge us to is what I like to call progressive holiness. This is growing in Christ-likeness, bearing the fruit of the spirit as a journey throughout our life. That the trajectory of my life is the transformation to become more like Christ. Progressive holiness. And so I define holiness this way. Holiness is simply living set apart. That instead of conforming to the world or my passions or my fleshly desires, that I could, I'd be transformed by Christ and live set apart, live to the glory of God and, and to the joy of myself as I glorify God. So holiness is living set apart. And here's the rub. You see, the call to holiness means there's gonna be times where what God wants me to do and how I want to live are two very different things. Let's just be real. We all run into that, right? God calls me to deny myself, take up my cross and follow him. I don't always wanna do that. Like there are days where I wake up in the morning, it really would feel good to leave the cross uh, at, at, in my bedroom and just do whatever I want today. But he says, deny yourself, take up your cross. That's a holiness issue. James, Jesus' little brother, he says, man, when you go through trials, count it all joy. Well, I don't always wanna do that. And so what God calls me to do in living holy and what I want, there's sometimes disagreement. And I found this uh, fairly sobering quote from Tim Keller, who's a Presbyterian minister and theologian and author. And here's what he said. He said, if your God never disagrees with you, you might be, or you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. Whoa. Like if, if, if I never have this tension and this call to holiness, this call to obedience, it's uncomfortable and, and, and sometimes painful. Maybe I'm not worshiping the God of the universe. Maybe I'm just worshiping a morally better version of me. And so we're going to look at the call to holiness. And my hope is we can avoid the ditches today. All right, so we're gonna be 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 13. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So whenever you see therefore in the passage, we always need to say, what is it there for? What's the therefore, therefore? This is linking to what Peter was writing and that Pastor Drew spoke on last week, that we have a, a living hope, that we've been born again into a, a living hope. Think about what this meant to the people who, were, who Peter was writing to. These are Christians who are being immensely persecuted. They're going through uh, immense trial, fiery trial, it, where their loved ones are being used as, as, as dog food and, and torches in Nero's garden. This is, they have real persecution happening. And he reminds them of the hope. And then he says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace. I love what he does. He calls their attention up out of their current circumstance. And he says, set your hope fully on the grace that what? That will be brought to you. He said, look, your current circumstances are not eternal, but Jesus is. And the hope you have in him is. So set your gaze up there. Don't just let the, the current circumstance that you're living in and you're experiencing overwhelm and, and cause you to live in despair. You have an eternal hope in Christ. And Peter calls their gaze upwards to that future hope in Christ. And he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. He says, look, at one point, you didn't know the hope. You didn't know the living hope. You weren't born again. You didn't treasure Christ. But that's not true of you anymore. And so don't conform yourself to the passions of your former ignorance. You don't have to live according to the, to the ignorance anymore. You've been made alive. You've been, you've been, your eyes have spiritually been opened. And now you can live according to the truth. Don't go back and live according to those fleshly passions that you had when you were ignorant of the truth. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Whoa. Like Peter just puts the problem in the room. 
Think about again what these people are going through. Extreme persecution. And Peter still calls them to a high, holy life. Why? Because that's a reflection of who God is. He calls them to live holy in the midst of the current darkness they're in. Why? Because a light shines brilliantly in the darkness. Notice he doesn't tell them overthrow your oppressors or, or fight back or, or flee, run from them. He says, live holy in the midst of the present darkness you find yourself in. And I do want to pause here for just a moment and call out something I see in the church in the last five-ish years. This call to holiness in the midst of darkness isn't just for the people that Peter was talking to. It's for us too. And I'm concerned when I see Christians who see the present darkness. There is darkness in this world that we're living in the midst of. And their response to the darkness is one of two things. Either I'm going to run from this and I'm going to get away from this culture. And I want to get into a huddle with other Christians and, and live and just kind of bubble. Or we need to overthrow. We need to take back. Well, I, that's not what Peter calls us to. That's not what God calls us to through Peter. He doesn't say overthrow. He doesn't say run from it. He says shine brightly in the midst of it by living holy. So I just want to call that out. And I want to challenge you. Like, are, do you struggle with that? I know as I look around and there's darkness all around, it's very easy to just want to run from it or try to fight back. But Peter doesn't tell these persecuted Christians to overthrow Rome. He doesn't tell them to run and hide. He says, shine brightly by living holy. Persecution was not an excuse to not live holy. We don't have an excuse to not live holy. And he says, since it is written, you should be holy for I am holy. This is from Leviticus. After God has given some of the law, he says, look, this reflects my character and I want my people to reflect my character because then they can show the world what I'm like. And he goes on. And if you call on him as father, I love that. Earlier, he called us children. Before he even gave the command, he called us children. He reminds them of our identity. And then again, he says, look, if you call on him as father, think again what this meant to these people. They're in the midst of immense suffering and they have a, a, a cosmic God who is their father that they can call on. If you call on him as father who judges impartially to eat, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout your time of exile. He, he, he notices their plight. He says, look, you're exiled. This is immense persecution. And he calls their eyes up again to the father who will judge their captors, who will judge them, who judges impartially. He calls their gaze again up out of their current circumstance to the truth of who God is, despite their circumstance. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. She says, look, you don't have to live how, how the forefathers did. You know that story in the Old Testament where, where the Israelites would kind of go through this cycle of bondage and they would, they would go through a season of, of, of idolatry and then God would raise up somebody to, to help them come to true repentance and then they'd come back to worship God and they'd go back into idolatry. God would raise somebody up. They'd worship for a while and this cycle just continues. So you don't have to live according to that legacy anymore. You've been ransomed up out of that. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Like our society values treasure so much. Like look at any rapper's neck. It's a status symbol, right? They got bling not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without spot or blemish. That Old Testament picture that Jesus is the once for all sacrifice for sin, where they used to have to sacrifice regularly animals for their sins. Now Jesus is the once for all sacrifice. And he goes on, he says, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, that Jesus eternally existed before creation but was made manifest in the last times for the, your sake, for the sake of you, that Jesus came for their sake. Why? Because through him, they would be made believers in God, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Jesus is the only way to the Father. And so he, he calls their eyes up again, 
Look at what Christ did for you. You don't have to live in your passions anymore of your former ignorance. You don't have to live according to the legacy of your forefathers. Jesus has ransomed you with his precious blood and you have access to the father as a result. And so Peter puts the problem in the room, live holy. I'm like, that's a great idea, Peter. How do I do that, man? Like, give me some tips. And so I want to go come back through what we just read and kind of pull out some ideas on how we can actually begin to do this. The first one, I kind of wrote it this way. Holy living comes from hope-filled thinking. Holy living comes from hope-filled thinking. Why? Because... Our beliefs are revealed by our behaviors, right? What I truly believe about God, myself and others, it will play out in in my actions. And holy living comes from hope-filled thinking. The battle for holiness happens here and here before we ever see it play out here. Let's look at it in the passage. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace. What, that's the command here. He says, set your hope. You want to live holy? Set your hope on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus and the grace that will be brought to you. Like, that's a great idea. But don't we have so many things that tell our minds where to dwell that, that aren't hope-filled? And so he gives us these two participles that come before the command to explain how we can actually do this. The first one is preparing your minds for action. Some translations say girding up the loins of your mind. Such a weird statement. But the idea there is soldiers would gird up their clothing so they could be active and engaged in the battle. I don't think that's how soldiers move. That's like a robot. I don't know. But but they they, they would be active and engaged in the battle. That They they would uh, be prepared to guard. And he says, prepare your minds, gird up the loins of your mind, be actively engaged in where you allow your mind to dwell. But he says more than that, and being sober minded. Now this isn't just the call to not go get drunk every Friday night. This is far more than that, although that's true. The idea is don't allow external things to influence and control where your mind dwells. Be active, be engaged, be in control. What we feed our mind should fuel our hope. That's what he's saying here. If we want to set our hope fully on grace, what we feed our mind should fuel our hope. And as we fuel our hope, our lives will be transformed and we will begin to live accordingly. So here's the question. What are you filling your mind with? I talk to my kids about this all the time. I say, every movie you watch, every TV show you watch, every song you listen to is preaching you a sermon. What's the gospel that they're teaching you? Does it line up with the truth? Or is it causing you to go into one of those ditches of legalism or license? What are you filling your mind with? The other day I was at my mom's house and we were there for 20 minutes and she had a newscast on the TV and we're sitting there and in 20 minutes, here's what I heard. There's a war in Russia. There's two countries that want to destroy us. Um, There was a commercial, like if you have these symptoms, you might have cancer. Another commercial that said, hey, if you have these symptoms, your your intestines may be ripped open. And then one of my favorite comedians died. And I turned to my wife after 20 minutes of newscast, like I'm filled with anxiety right now. Why? Because an external source was causing my mind to go down a path that didn't fuel my hope, but fueled despair. And so what are you filling your mind with? We have so many things bombarding our minds and telling them where to dwell. News media, social media, there's, there's t- culture tells us what we should dwell our minds on. Uh, and if we're not active and engaged and in control with where, what's going on here, we will never live out holiness here because what we fuel here does eventually come out in our life. What we, our beliefs are revealed by our behaviors. What we believe here comes out in how we live. And so what are you filling your mind with? There's a helpful tool that we've used over the last couple of years at Family Church called Fruit to Root. And if you want to draw this diagram, I encourage you on the back side of your notes on the blank page there, um, two trees. And this is, if you don't know where your mind's dwelling, you're like, man, I don't understand. I don't know where my mind is, but I see fruit in my life that's like negative and anxious and fearful and worried. 
This is a helpful tool to get you to the bottom of what you're believing, what you're thinking, where your mind's dwelling, where your heart's dwelling, and then to go through a repentance process and confess the truth. So the tree on the left-hand side is called the confession of sin. And if you look at your life and the fruit of your life is anxiety, desire for control, fear, worry, you can ask yourself these questions. First ones, who am I? Well, when I'm experiencing anxiety, I feel like I need to be in control, but I'm not. And I know I can't be. And then beyond that, what has God done? When I'm experiencing anxiety, what do I believe about what God has done? I believe he's far away. I believe he's, he's distant. He's left me. He's abandoned me. And now I've got to try and figure out this life thing by myself. Well, and a deeper question here. As a result of the fruit I'm experiencing, what do I believe about God? Who's God to me? Well, when I'm feeling I need to be in control, I believe God is an absent father who doesn't love me and is uncaring. Is that true? No, but it's important to get to the root of what's fueling the behavior we see. And then you go through a repentance process. So these are the things I feel in the moment, but they're not true of God. And so what is true of God? Who is God truly? Well, God's not absent. He's close. He's so close. He lives in me. I'm a temple of the spirit. Well, what has God done? Jesus died in my place, like the greatest act of love ever, right? And so, so to say that, that God is uh, distant and unloving and uncaring, is not true. And then as a result of that, who am I? Well, as a result of what Jesus did, I'm loved, I'm cared for, I'm, I'm forgiven. What fruit does that begin to well up in me? That is hope and love and peace, the, the fruit of the spirit, and so if you don't know where your mind is dwelling, this is a helpful tool for you to begin to evaluate that process. The second thing I want us to see in this passage is holy living comes from believing our identity. This is a very small portion of the passage, but it's super important. He's, he says, verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Before he gives the command, he reminds us who we are. He says, look, you are children of God. You aren't just subjects who were pardoned in the kingdom. Like that would be very gracious of God, but God's grace is more lavish than that. He didn't just pardon you and allow you to be in his kingdom. He said, come sit at the family dinner table with me. You're my child. You've been adopted in Christ. And you know, those, those awkward teenage years where you're trying on all these identities and trying to figure out like where you fit in the world. Am I a jock? Am I a prep? Am I a punk rocker? I'm afraid Far too often, and I know this is true for me at times too, Christians get spiritually stuck in the teenage years and we just don't believe who God says we are, that we are a new creation, that we are our children, that we are holy. I had the privilege of going through a discipleship group with some men over uh, the last year and, and we had an exercise where we had to speak our identity. The statement we had to say is, I am holy, but we had to put our name in there. We had to do this in front of the group. And so I had to say, Jason is holy. And I had guys coming up to me, some, some of them in tears. These men have been following Jesus for a long time saying, I felt dirty to make that statement, to say I'm holy, that I'm a child of God. I, it felt dirty to acknowledge that truth. Listen, Jesus didn't cleanse you so you could live according to a filthy identity. You've been washed in the blood of Christ. You are holy. Even when you don't practically live that out perfectly, you're holy in God, in Christ. God looks at you and says, you're holy, perfect because of what Jesus did. So here's the question. What's the identity you're living from? You have identity spoken over you all the time. Culture tells you who you are. Your family of origin tells you who you are. Maybe even the family you're raising right now tells you who you are. Your workplace tells you who you are. Your friends tell you who you are. What identity are you living from? Do you believe the truth about God? If, if holy living comes from believing our identity, before we get the command, he reminds us who we are. We must believe our identity or we will fall into the ditch of legalism and try to earn our identity. And you can't, earn holiness. You can't earn adoption. It's a free gift given to you by your father. So what identity are you living from? 
Like if you were to honestly evaluate, and this may be a good question for you to ask your spouse or your mom or dad or someone that's a trusted person to say, do you see me living from a space of, of truth and in who God says I am? Or have I taken on another identity? What is the identity you are living from today? Not 10 years ago, not the identity you want to live from, What identity are you truly living from? So important. Holy living comes from believing our identity. The last piece I want us to see in this passage is holy living comes from a proper view of God. Let's look at it. In verse 17, it says, if you call on him as father. So we've got this God who is our father. There's this close relational language, children and a father. And often that's propped up, right? We, we hear about adoption and, and being a child and, and being a father all the time, but that's not the only thing this verse says about God. And it's real easy to brush past the next truth. A father who judges impartially. You see the reality is that God, yes, he's a father if you're in Christ, but he's also the impartial judge of the universe. And one day everyone will stand before God. And this verse says that he will judge each of us according to our deeds. And so those are two inextricable truths about God. You can't separate them. In fact, if you just focus on God as a father, it's very easy to fall into the ditch of license. License to sin where it doesn't matter. God loves me. Me me, me and dads hang out all the time. It's easy to fall into that ditch of license. And then if, if you only view God as the judge, it's easy to fall into the ditch of legalism. Man, God is gonna judge my life and I have got to earn his favor or I'm not getting out of that courtroom, okay? But it's when we hold these two truths together in tension, that we can have a proper view of God that he says will come out in conducting ourselves with fear. The word there is actually trembling because God holds my next breath. He holds my tomorrow. He holds my eternity. And so he says, what we rightly believe about God will come out in our conduct. Holy living comes from a proper view of God. So have you fallen into one of those ditches? Do you just look at God as a buddy? It's like, hey, me and my dad, we're okay, but you don't remember the the holiness of God, the righteous judge that he is? Or maybe are you in the ditch of legalism that says, man, God is a judge. And you forget that in Christ, you have lavish grace. So easy to fall into those two ditches, but we want to walk the middle of the track. We want to go down the middle of the road so that we don't fall into false gospels. Both of those ditches, again, are false gospels. So is your view of God inaccurate? And let me answer that for all of us. Yes. Like not on purpose, but all of us have areas where we don't view God properly where we're either trying to earn his favor in this ditch or we're, we're abusing his favor in this ditch. It happens. We're fallible people who are trying to align our beliefs with what scripture says about him, but it's so easy to fall into one of those ditches. So how is your view of God inaccurate? And here's why this whole idea of being called to holiness is so important. You see, Peter, he doesn't mince meat about this. He puts the problem in the room, even in the midst of these people, despair and the darkness they're currently living in as exiles under oppression. The reason why this matters is because lights shine brilliantly in the darkness. And as you and I are called to live holy, yes, it's for God's glory and it's for our good, But there's a third reason. Other people will see you shining brilliantly in the darkness. It's about the mission of God where you live, work, and play. As people see you in your holy conduct, as you are believing who God says you are, as you're believing who God says he is, and as you're aligning your thoughts and your heart with the hope you have in God, holy living will come to fruition. And people will see your holy conduct And it will be a missional life 
that they'll be drawn to Christ in you. This isn't just about glorifying God, although that's true. It's not just about your betterment, although when you live holy, it it does bring about good in your life. It's about the mission. It's about being people, helping people find and follow Jesus. And so I want to challenge you again. Don't just take my words for it today. Go home, study the scripture, read these things out for yourself evaluate before God, have I fallen into a ditch? I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. Thank you so much for hanging around with me. I appreciate you being here with us for really just a challenging call that God has called us to holiness. And here's the the question I want you to wrestle with, um, maybe in your home as a conversation today, or maybe something to be praying about over the next couple of days and, and speak with a trusted friend on. Which ditch do you find yourself falling into? Legalism or license? Like if we want to have the pursuit of holiness in our life, we have to acknowledge the times when we fall into false gospel living and come back to the middle of the road that yes, there's lavish grace in Jesus Christ. And yes, I'm called to obedience. And here's the rub. You see, the call to obedience, it doesn't add to the gospel. It honors the gospel. Let me pray for us. Father God, uh, you have challenging words for us. And, and God, I, I know as myself, I, I don't always live up to the call of holiness, to the call of obedience, to the call of all of my conduct aligning with what I believe. There is an integrity gap, God, in all of us, and myself included. And so I pray as you have challenged us in this, that you would begin to remind us of your grace that is the transforming power of God at work in our lives. That we wouldn't pursue holiness by ourselves as a fruitless endeavor, but that we would pursue holiness in your strength by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for hanging out with me. Love you. Have a good Sunday.